Okay, welcome to the second annual, yes, it is the second annual Game Development and Design Mini Conference. And so how this started last year was that I had five capstones. I think it was five. It was an insane number. Uh, and in order to sort of give everyone uh, enough feedback and to sort of have everyone learn from each other, I came up with this idea of having everyone present. And it was actually one of the last things we did right before uh, the pandemic started. Uh, so, oh, my video was not on. Okay, hi, yes, I'm here in my office. Uh, because if I did this at home, there's too high of a chance that uh, one of my children will want to show my cats to you. So I figured this would be safer if I did it here. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I did this thing and it was a great success, I thought. I thought everyone had fun, everyone learned from each other. Uh, the one super sad thing, though, uh, is that I was able to give them free pizza, and I really couldn't figure out a way to do that uh, for a remote event like this. Uh, maybe there was a way I could have sent the Purdue robot things, but then we have people not on campus, so how do I do that? I don't know. So I want to thank all of you for coming here uh, virtually and doing this, because I have nothing to offer you but the esprit de corps of your peers, my feedback, the feedback and questions of your peers. And so what this tells me, and this really is a reminder because this is something I've learned all about you at my uh, time here at Purdue, semester number four now, is you all want to do this very passionately to the point where any opportunity that you have to make, not just make games, but also to kind of engage in all of the intellectual craft work that goes with the making them, which means showing them to peers, having that GDC-like experience, all that really matters to you and you're willing to do it and you don't need free pizza to do it or a grade or anything like that. So thank you. You're all, the sound totally cheesy in that 1980s way. Of course, that was my youth. You're all winners in my book for uh, wanting to do this. Uh, okay, so uh, there's no real ground rules here. It's all very casual. I've all kind of given you suggestions on how to kind of structure your presentations, but it really is up to you. But in general, take about 10 minutes. That's really the only time I'll cut in is if it starts to go much over 10 minutes. So that way there's at least some time for questions. Uh, that's really it. Uh, what you show is completely up to you. And uh, we have a variety of things. We have capstone teams. We have individual projects that are actually completely done. And, and this is the chance for people to show those things. We have all projects at the very beginning, projects at the end, uh, and everything in between. So we'll be getting some post-mortems, some mid-mortems, some pre-production stuff. It's a tremendous variety of, of things. So, okay, let's get started. Unless you have any questions, or any questions for me about this before we officially rock and roll here. Okay, and I'm going to look, of course, in the WebEx uh, chat. Yes, I absolutely do owe you all a slice of pizza at some point. Uh, but it has to be the cauliflower crust pizza uh, from that one place on, in the Chauncey District. <laughs> it is actually pretty good. I forget the pizza shop, not Round Table. For those of you uh, that ever end up in the California West Coast area, avoid Round Table pizza. It's the worst pizza. Yes, Mad Mushroom's the one. Their cauliflower crust is actually quite good. So yeah, avoid round table pizza wherever your travels may take you. That's maybe some of the most important advice I can give anybody uh, really any in any endeavor in life. Uh, so without wasting any more time, our first presenter uh, today is actually kind of a special scenario. So I do want to take a moment uh, to kind of explain this. So uh, a lot of you are Purdue seniors. A lot of you are Purdue juniors and sophomores, right? Uh, we have today with us Sophia Alexander, who is actually a high school senior that's going to be joining the program in the fall, so an incoming freshman. Now, how do we know Sophia? Well, I think it was T.R. O'Neill, uh, who's my uh, actually backyard neighbor. Uh, I don't know if any of you know that. He lives right behind me. Uh, he did not knock on my door, though. He emailed me to say, hey, there's a high school student, they're a high school class. I'm probably not remembering all the details correctly, but it's uh, they need them to work with, you know, college students that are kind of involved in their field. Are you willing to do this? Of course, yes, we were. So uh, Sophia has been in our Discord by R, I mean, uh, Mage Studios, the capstone team I advise. Uh, she's been in our regular meetings. She's been doing QA for us. 
uh, providing feedback uh, for us. And also she has her own project and that is what she's presenting to us uh, today. Uh, so uh, Sophia, whenever you're ready, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, share your screen and go ahead and present. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, like Robert said, my name is Sophia. I am a high school senior at Greenwood High, a little south of Indianapolis. And I've had an extreme interest in game development for a long time. I tried writing. I tried art. I tried all kinds of different mediums to tell stories, but video games is what really stuck. Um, kind of a fun little tidbit about me. I got into game design because games bore me easily. So I want to make a game that won't bore anybody, if that kind of makes sense. So, all right, first I'm going to show you guys a short little presentation I put together, and then I'll get into what I have done so far of my game, which is actually my senior capstone project for high school, which my teachers are just very impressed with. So let's see if I can figure out how the sharing works. Share and then screen. Aha, there we go. Okay. Then, nope, not that. Where's that? We are way, okay, there we go. So the game is called Nocturnal Ticks and it is a steampunk game that I came up with roughly three years ago, but we'll get into the timeline later. Nocturnal Ticks is a third-person adventure with murder, mystery, love if you choose it. Although, because there are different endings, you don't have to choose that route. And we'll get into the multi-endings later. So first, we'll talk about the creator. I put creators because initially I was going to put give MayJ their own little section in the slide. But in the end, I decided to give them their own slide altogether because these students and Robert have helped me tremendously. I have tried so many times <laughs> to figure out game engines on my own and it was ridiculously hard. So just a short shout out to them before they get their very own slide at the end. Just amazing people to work with, very patient, um, even when I send messages at two in the morning. <laughs> so um, like I said, my name's Sophia. I just turned 18 last November. I go to Greenwood High, and my incoming major is game development and design. I got into game design to tell compelling stories, make adventures for people to get involved in, and to work with computers. Now, in the beginning stages of Nocturnal Ticks, I wanted it to be a memorable first game. You know, something that people would see and remember later and they'd see my other games oh well that's the creator of nocturnal ticks maybe this game will be good too i want it to be a good foundation for the business i hope to create which is um unreality core it sounds like something lex luther would put together but <laughs> um it's also my high school senior project i have to have a senior capstone to graduate so when they told me i could pick my own project and that i could use this as an excuse to contact people to help me, I immediately jumped on the game design wagon. Um, I've been working on the paper design development for three years, working out plot, working out characters, countries, all kinds of fun jazz that's all in my Google Drive. If I had enough time, I would show it to you, but that would take hours. So we're not gonna do that today. Um, I've been spending the last three or four months in Unreal development with the help of MayJ Studios. Um, and it's been amazing and eye-opening and I've created my own little world, which I'll get to show you here in a moment. And then it has a web plot and multi-ending, which I have a uh, little slide about how web, uh, web plots work towards the middle here. But essentially you have different routes that you can go on that all lead back to a central plot line. And I think that's really cool. All right, so now about the paper design specifically. I've been spending the last three years doing the paper design, as I said before, mainly on plot, characters, countries, and then I've done some maps and diagrams as well, both hand-drawn and, uh, and digital. The paper design is all on Google Drive, which as long as Google doesn't crash, we're fine. I've had that happen before. 
and I've made so many changes over the first three years. Originally, Nocturnal Ticks was about an orphan, but now it's about the apprentice at a clock shop that is owned by their parents. And the clock shop has the same name as the game, for reasons you guys don't get to know until you play. Alright, so plot elements. It's supposed to tell a really big and broad encompassing story about a group of two to three countries at war and how one person was able to not only stop the fighting, but also figure out how it started in the first place and how it can be prevented, all while achieving his dream of becoming a doctor. It's third person, so you get to see your character and you get to run around and see the whole world, not just through their eyes, but kind of all around them at one time. It has multiple endings, as I mentioned before, but it's all one story. Think of it as kind of a good example would be Detroit Become Human. They had an incredible web plot that I just fell in love with. I had to play it 30 times to get all the endings, but I made sure I did that. And um, along with the web style plot, you have plot diverts with choices. I made a little diagram that shows you kind of the different choices you can make and how they lead back to the plot. This is a very simplified simplified version of how nocturnal ticks will work um, because there will be a lot more choices within choices within choices. So far I have 36 endings planned out and hope to have the project fully completed by the time I graduate Purdue in about four and a half years. Next, we're going to talk about some of my characters. The first one is the main character who is named Noct Clem. Some of these are going to be a little difficult to pronounce. I apologize. <laughs> but he is the son of two clocksmiths, one of which is his father who passed away, which is the central why he went out on this adventure. He wants to discover how his father died. Initially, it was thought to have been suicide, but they figure out later that it was murder from the government. The government came and murdered him for secrets. I probably shouldn't be spoiling all of this, but it's, it's okay. <laughs> and he loves anatomy. Like I said earlier, he wants to be a doctor. There's a kind of study system in part of it where you can go on this little diverted path, and the more study points you get towards anatomy, more doors and paths will unlock. And there's a really intricate trophy system too. Next, we're going to talk about Aluminium Gray. Yes, he was named after the metal. That's not very creative. <laughs> but he is our home general, and he is one of the um, romance options if you so choose to go down that path. He's rather cold and distant. He doesn't get close to others easily, but once he does get close to you, he gets very close to you. He has a lot of PTSD from different battles that he's won and lost, and nearly getting blown up a few times but he enjoys fantasy books things like harry potter for example which is a great book series <laughs> and then next is yameta shargia yameta is a foreign general so kind of the polar opposite of aluminium um, they're loud and outspoken strategic confident and they enjoy tea and stuffed animals now, I use the pronouns they on purpose. They are gender fluid. I wanted to incorporate some kind of diversity so that I could kind of include everybody. And then this is Ray. Ray is very special because Ray is a sentient robot. Ray owns a small little flower shop that you get to see in the very beginning of the game, where you have to go to her flower shop to pick up flowers to take to Knox dad's grave and that's how you discover that Knox dad has passed away in the first place and it kind of just gets that ball rolling on well how did this happen um, Ray loves hot chocolate poetry and different stories not necessarily all fiction you know she'll read some some non-fiction from time to time and then next my very last slide is a special thank you to May J Studios and to Robert for helping me out with this incredibly large project this would not have been possible without them, and I am so thankful for them all, not only working with me as a person, but for working with a high school senior who has never done any of this before. And I, I could not thank them enough, so a special thank you to them. 
And that's the end of that presentation. And now we'll move on to what the project actually currently looks like, which is this. So most of the front of this building I've done today in the last half hour, because I just figured out how this asset packed worked. <laughs> but I also did that. Now this is a pre-built building that came with my asset pack, which was very expensive, it was $150, but it was worth it. <laughs> so unfortunately you cannot go in this building. I wanna try and figure out if you can later. I've been notified that there are ways to script doors opening, which I'm gonna figure that out later and it's gonna be a lot of fun. But other than applying the asset pack, I have, I guess, sketched, you could call it three diff six different buildings, three on each side. And each of them has a specific purpose on a diagram, which I will show you here. This is kind of my little hidey hole. So <laughs> this is the diagram of all the buildings that I plan to have in this one map, this one little city section. And so far, all the ones in green are the ones that have been done. Nocturnal Ticks being the clock shop where you start at the beginning and where Noct lives. I plan to expand it to Ray's Flower Shop, the Barber Shop, and all of these buildings here after I submit my senior capstone. I want to get done as much as I can before that, but with these six buildings. That way they're looking at something other than blocks when I put this on a disc and ask them to run around in it. Let's see. All right. That's about all that I had planned for this presentation. I thought it would take a little longer than it did. Does anybody have any questions for me? Or criticism, I'll take criticism too. All right, um, if no one's gonna jump in right away uh, with a question, um, I'll go ahead and get that started here. Um, and so we're good on time because I know it's supposed to be 615 Yorgos, but we have an empty slot at the end. That's why I blabbed at the beginning and all that, because we have just a little wiggle room here. Um, okay, so um, I guess this is less of a, uh, a question than a, a pedagogical suggestion. Sorry, it's my gig, it's what I do. Um, so um, I love the, you know, I love the, the sort of ambition here, um, you know, especially I, I noted that, that you have, because I remember thinking like, geez, this, seems like a massive project and you said oh your goal is to get it done four and a half years okay fair fair play on that right um so i think there are two ways to go with building something like this and they're each valid and you'll just have to decide uh, it's probably not the only two ways but when i try to break something down like this okay so what you probably don't want to do is you know when you write a story it's like you can literally just start chapter one and chapter two, chapter three. That's very hard to do in game making, right? Like this sort of linear creation of start at the beginning of the game, start at the end of the game. Because games are sort of combinations of many systems working in concert. And what tends to happen when you try to make a game that way uh, is that it's so slow going at first that like it gets really frustrating and that's where a lot of people get burned out or whatever. Uh, so what I would do is this, I would either um, go real broad, like think, okay, I'm going to literally make my grand epic story in the simplest, tiniest way possible first. It's not going to, that's not going to be how the project ends, but like, okay, let's say you are a villager and the game ends after you fight the dragon. There's a bunch of things that happen in between, right? Uh, what you would do is you would start with just a character that runs to a bunch of boxes in the shape of a dragon and you press a button and you win. Right. Okay. And now you have your complete game and then you go back and then if you add, maybe you talk to one NPC on the way. Now, maybe you put three NPCs and maybe now you have a little item shop where you can buy one thing. You know what I mean? Every iteration, you fill in the middle more. Right. Some people work well that way. The other way that works is you start building the systems. Right. Where you're like, OK, I'm going to just focus on the NPC interaction system like how that even works i'm gonna or in your case i'm just gonna focus entirely on my web-based story implementation with some really simple story that i get working first 
That way you start building the underlying things and then you can kind of build on top of that. So just be kind of my suggestion. Now, why blab? Did any of you have a question? Uh, Yorgos, your hand is up. Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, um, really great presentation. I was curious um, what you intend the gameplay to look like once it's completed. Once the gameplay is completed, I intend, like I said, I have, I intend for it to be in third person. You'll spend the majority of the game um, running around, not even in the town you see now, but you'll just kind of be running around different battlefields, different towns. Um, it's going to be a lot of, a lot of running. Um, you'll, you'll spend a lot less time interacting with NPCs and a lot more time getting from place to place and exploring this little world. And it will be a free roam. There won't be like a little, um, arrow telling you where to go. You kind of just get to explore and find things on your own, which I think is really important in world building so that you get a better broad scope of, of how it looks and how the world functions, if that makes any sense. Yep. Cool. Thank you. All right. I think we have time for one more question uh, before we should move on actually to you, Yorgo. So any, any last questions? Uh, Austin, you have your hand up. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I would say I'm just curious about, I guess, like your biggest inspirations for this. And maybe if you have any specific in, um, inspirations, if you have any ideas about how you can look at systems in games that you do enjoy that are similar and not like copy paste them, you know, but take, yeah, take just like an isolated system and be like, oh, how does how does this specific thing in this game work? And then kind of try to reverse engineer that. That is something also that's helped me kind of understand development of specific things. Yeah. Um, as far as inspiration goes, I have my little hat here. Um, I got this hat because I really like steampunk. I've liked steampunk probably for the first, well, for the last five or six years and it, it's always been a thing that I've really enjoyed and been intrigued by and um, I was unaware of any really big steampunk games you know whether it was on Steam or any other platform so I decided I would make one um, and that's kind of where I got the I want this to be steampunk from as far as the storyline for six years from the fifth grade from from the fifth grade, starting in the fifth grade, for the six years after, I was trying to write a book very unsuccessfully. My grandpa's an author, so the first route I tried would be writing. That did not end well because there were no images, and I can't focus if there aren't images. <laughs> um, but the book was originally about an angel and a demon that bring um, heaven and hell together and essentially accidentally destroy Earth. It was going to be great. But I kind of ended up scrapping that idea when I realized there was no way I was getting a book published. And I took a lot of the concepts from that and said, well, what if I made it into a video game? But then I just kind of put in steampunk. And then I just kind of got rid of the angel demon factor. And then I just <laughs> added in this crazy <laughs> lunatic on the other side of the border that likes stuffed animals. <laughs> and I just kind of started adding things in and it got farther and farther away from my inspiration. But... In the end, it all started with me wanting to create something memorable and new and me enjoying steampunk. And I just kind of molded those together. And it turned out to be something that I wasn't expecting at all at first. This looks nothing like my original art, which is horrible, by the way. I, I can't draw to save my life. But And I, I hope I'm answering your question. It... It all yeah, came yeah. from different places, but now it resembles none of those places. I think that something that might be helpful as a result of that is to kind of look around at um, any games that are similar. Like you said, you really liked um, Detroit. Uh, if you could just like cherry pick things out of that, like, oh, I wonder how they made this thing work, you know? And um, I know some people have a lot of qualms about like Elder Scrolls games, but they have some of the best, um, I think like passive world building in a lot of games I've seen. Like there's, there's stuff where you're just walking through the forest and there's a dead guy and he's got a letter on him and 
<laughs> it's like it tells the whole backstory of like why he was why he was there and what killed him and just like little little hints and things like that so looking at other role-playing games and maybe kind of throwing together a document of just like an inspiration board and things that you can kind of pull from um i think without something like that it's really easy to get excited about all these ideas and things can get away from you and it's important to be passionate and it's it's great stuff it's cool that you can pull from so many source of sources of inspiration um but finding a way to take that inspiration and then kind of like put bullet points with each thing that inspires you of like these are the things i'm taking from these different things uh just so that designs don't kind of get away from you and it gets way too big way too fast um and on that note uh let me go ahead and um thank you for all that austin thank you for that sophia um by the way i'll just comment super brave as a high school senior to want to like jump in and present to a bunch of college uh folk uh so i very much appreciate that thank you so much for doing this so uh a, a socially distanced round of applause uh to sophia for presenting so thank you very much um, okay, uh, let's move on now to Yorgos. You have an individual project that you want to show, so go ahead and, and stop your share, Sophia, and, and go ahead and start your share, Yorgos. As soon as I figure out how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I've never used WebEx before, so I'm slowly learning. Oh. I think it's probably in the middle um, row of buttons there. There should be a stop share oh. i was gonna say i don't really ha oh is it up here ha ha ha, ha. Yes. It's there we go okay and then i'll mute myself all right can everybody hear me good all right yeah so this is uh, my game project called uh, Lost Machines by the company Soulware. And uh, the game summary, it's a 3D side-scrolling action platformer. Uh, you play as the character Lilith as she is traveling through the uh, machine world of Eden on her uh, quest to defeat Eve, her uh, tormentor. So the combat involves uh, the character's ability are um, a projectile weapon, a melee weapon, and uh, also some stealth-based mechanics. Uh, there are four common enemy types, uh, which I won't get into too much in, in too much detail. There's a total of nine bo unique boss fights, uh, seven main levels, three kind of transitional levels, uh, one secret level, and a lot of pickups that you can uh, find along the way to aid you on your journey. So just kind of a status report on how it's going. Um, I've completed development and I released it on itch.io uh, last January. Um, haven't re received a ton of feedback on it. Um, total, i um, got a couple downloads, but I uh, haven't really gotten any feedback from users yet. Still waiting on that. Um, and if I do get some feedback, I would definitely intend to improve upon that, uh, whatever feedback I get. So just kind of to show off a vertical slice of what I've got. So one of the main systems for the projectile weapon is a targeting system that allows the player to basically focus an enemy while trying to avoid projectiles.
So obviously I died there, but that's kind of what the gameplay looks like. Um, that was an example of, that was actually just one of the basic enemies that wasn't a boss fight. The boss fights are a bit larger, something like this image here. Um, so that's where the project's at now. Uh, what went well, what didn't go well. So, well, the first thing that went well is I had a lot of fun creating this. I started this project um, last summer uh, during, you know, COVID lockdown. I decided I wanted to do something, you know, productive. So I decided to make this game. Um, I did learn quite a bit from this experience and um, it's really pushed me to hopefully make bigger and better games in the future. Uh, so things that I say when... Uh, poorly, but they more just they're more learning experiences for me than things that actually went bad. Um, so there was an early vision change. I always knew I wanted to create a three D platformer, but at start the uh, at the start of the process, the theme was uh, very different than what it ended up being. It was kind of a Jap Japanese mythology themed game, and then it kind of transitioned into this uh, sci fi robot theme. Uh, so that transition took some work to figure out. Um, I had a pretty rocky development process at the beginning. I kind of went in guns blazing without really figuring things out to begin with. And one of the things this resulted in was I had to change the core combat about halfway through development because I found it just wasn't all that fun. So that's where the um, added of the stealth mechanic came in. So you could actually, you know, you saw there, I was defeating some of those enemies in one strike. If I had alerted those enemies to my presence before doing that swiftly, it would have taken more hits to kill them. And I, that just made the combat bit more deep uh the story and narrative w underwent several rewrites um i always had the, kind of this theme in mind uh but the actual what the actual story ended up being is slightly different than what it was originally uh so just some of the takeaways i learned um i learned about the importance of pre-production you know i mean figuring out you know, the scope and the plan for what you really want to do early on will help will save you a lot of trouble in the later stages. Um, test before you get too deep. This just involves you know, kind of the gameplay, making sure that you like where the gameplay is heading, because it's always easier to change things early on than once they're in, you know, deeply rooted into the project and changing them changes everything. Um, also learned about the importance of just getting something done, you know, I mean, I spent about half a year working on this, uh, working on it almost every day, and it just never felt like it was done. It was hard for me to decide, okay, now I'm done. And it was important for me to do that so that way I could kind of take a step back and really look at what I'd created and you know look at what I wanted to do in the future. And something I really encountered was the last mile problem, You know that kind of final stretch. The game was content complete in uh, late October, but it still took me, you know, two and a half months to get it all coming together with sound design and some final uh, polishing of bosses and enemies. So just, you may think you're done, but then actually getting it finished is a whole nother endeavor. So that's my project uh, and I'll open up for questions. Okay, Austin, you have your hand up. Oh, that's my bad. I didn't take it down. Uh, <laughs> all right. I, I do have a question, unless someone else has one, though. If anyone else has one. By all means, ask away. All right. Um, what was kind of the, the process of... What, was there anything, aside from just realizing combat was a little boring early on, that was difficult, and that was the... Like, as a result of your processes that weren't great early on... Are there any like specific takeaways that you got as you were developing that's like, oh, I wish I knew this when I started? Um, yeah, definitely. White boxing. It's something we learn in CGT, but something I really didn't take advantage of as well as I should have in this project. I was kind of just winging the level design. I think that definitely con contributed to the combat not being very fun because I constantly had to go back and fix the levels because I didn't have a very good idea of what I wanted to do with them from the beginning. So that definitely went into the process of not having that lockdown early. You'd be surprised how much that happens, even, you know, in, in professional games. I'll, I'll just say that. Uh, <laughs> everyone, everyone doubts the processes. <laughs> uh, or in your case, you know, you're, you're new to this, right? So uh, it's learning them in the first place, but there's always this, do we really need to do this stuff? 
And then, and then, you know, you actually try to do things without the nice processes and you were like, yes, actually it helps <laughs> a lot to do the stuff. Right. So yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, okay. I'll ask a question then. Um, so uh, you might remember in CGT 255, those of you that might be watching this later, you don't know what that is. That's game dev two. Um, and I talk about, I have a lecture where I talk about uh, designing games by thinking of game mechanics first. And, I, and, and what I think is more common is the opposite of that, where you, you sort of have, and I do this too, you get a story in your head and games are an awesome way to tell stories. And so the inclination is always to start with, with story first. It seems like you did that. Uh, at your, if you were to take another crack at this, do you think you would have had more success if you had started trying to come up with cool game mechanics first and then tried to like graft a story on top? Yeah, I think I would have had more success. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned that because actually, what the mechan I the what inspired me to make a game was actually viewing a mechanic from a YouTube video for another game, which was basically the mechanic is you're sneaking around in this swamp area and there are these floating lights above you. If you walk into the um, kind of the rays of light cast by these, enemies will spawn around you. So it's stealth. You're trying to sneak past these while not while not alerting the enemies to your presence and avoiding these lights. I really thought that was an interesting mechanic where if you enter an area, enemies will start spawning. And I started working with that originally, that mechanic. And then I actually ended up forgetting that that's what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not in this game at all. So if I had a second crack at it, that would definitely be a mechanic that I worked in. I, I realized like halfway through production that I didn't have that mechanic anywhere in sight, but everything was already so uh, rooted in the code was already written. And I was like, Oh, uh, shoot. <laughs> and I do want to compliment you on something you did say, because I think it's so important, the whole like learning to finish, right? Because you had these issues and you're like not entirely happy with necessarily everything was going. But now there is sometimes it's OK to be like, this was a learning experience and I'm just going to be like done with it or whatever. But when you can finish something and be done, even if you're going to update it later and all that, um, you know, that's a powerful thing. So good job on, on finishing. I think that's really great that you're able to do that. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Okay. I have one more for this and then, then we'll move on. So this has a very distinct visual look, right? I'm seeing a lot of monochromes. It's sort of, um, a grayscale of sort of pops of color. It does seem very, it seems art directed. It really does, right? So that's great. What was your inspiration for the overall look of the game? Um, I wanted the entire world to kind of feel like you were running through a big computer system. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of the aesthetic of all the kind of the grids and the sharp angles. That was the aesthetic I wanted to present because essentially the entire world is used as the brain for what was going to be the main boss and then i changed the story so didn't end up being but that was kind of the inspiration for it yeah and and i think what's cool about it is this right like i know i'm familiar enough with you to kind of know your skill set you're you're perfectly capable of going in maya and making things but you probably don't consider yourself a full-on you know environment artist that's gonna like do all the things right but because you have a consistent art look that just kind of makes everything look better regardless of like the individual complexity of each thing, right? There's like a sum that's greater than the parts if the look is cohesive. And I, and I do see that in, in this. Yeah, there's like a total of maybe six individual pieces of geometry I actually modeled, but I just kept, you know, using them over and over again in different ways. So to try and create an interesting look, I don't know if I succeeded, but that's what I did. <laughs> All right, any, any last questions for Yorgos before we move on? Okay, going once, going twice. Okay, thank you very much for showing this. Go out into itch.io and check it out. I know I, I keep wanting to, and hopefully tonight I will actually do that. Um, you know, I, I'll blame the semester. Uh, but yes, yeah, support. Whenever a Purdue person puts something out actually in the marketplace, go go support. That's that's so awesome. Okay, so right, thank uh, you. let's move on uh, to another individual project that I'm really happy to have people see, because I've seen this actually quite a few times because I'm advising it. Uh, so Andrew, Andrew Weigand, uh, please go ahead and share and unmute. Okay, so let me just pull it up real quick.
I'm doing it real quick. Turn this down so that the game audio isn't louder than me. Okay, so can everybody see and hear it? Okay, so my game is uh, it's called Continent at War, and it is a retro-style JRPG game. And what I have done right now is a uh, complete demo of a single dungeon. So let's go ahead and boot it up. So this game is one that I have worked on for my... Uh, so in the Honors College, and part of the requirements is that you have to have a, a, a scholarly project, and that can be... Uh, pretty much anything. Most of them are like research papers, but it can also be a creative project. So this is what I have for this. I mean, I started working on it before this, but when I discovered I could do it for this, that um, was kind of perfect. Anyway, let's. So we started off. We have some story segments. And for this presentation, by the way, I'm just going to be playing through the du the, the dungeon I have because it's about ten minutes. So that's pretty good for what I have. So yeah, we start off and we have some uh, some dialogue. So let's just get through this. Anyways, now we have the gameplay. So, yeah, as I said, it's a retro style JRPG. So, we got encounters and dungeons, pretty much everything you expect from this genre. So, let's go ahead and start our first combat. So, yeah, I got uh, four playable characters. I'll go over real quick. Kind of, yeah. Some of the stuff is kind of blocked off by the, um, uh, the, Display from what's it from a uh, WebEx so I can actually see how much damage some of the attacks are doing to my characters. So I'm just gonna have to kind of work through that. But anyways, um, so Nina is the main character and she fulfills kind of the uh, all around balanced character, jack of all trades, master of none. Uh, Douglas, the uh, blue haired one with the lance, he kind of fulfills both role as the uh, defensive knight type character. He has the best defenses of anybody, but also of the healer. He has uh, the best healing spell in this demo. So uh, Jade sort of fulfills the role of the um, the powerhouse. She has huge strength, but not a lot of uh, defenses or speed. She's still faster than Doug, who's the slowest, but she is at a disadvantage in that sense. And finally, Neil fulfills the role of the mage. She has the best magic in the game. This you know, spell's going to do quite a lot of damage. Um, but he also has pretty low defenses. I'm probably going to have to start playing a little quicker because, again, I'm a bit on a time limit, so I should probably start unloading my stronger spells on these enemies. If I don't end up, um, oops, I don't have a lot of times for it to be bad. I also try fleeing, but the way for that is, yeah, it could be better. I mean, I'm not saying that I could make it in terms of game design, but I'm just saying that in terms of the flee rate, it's, I mean, it's based on the speeds, but I've seen it's about 50-50 most of the time. Yeah, medical orb and I guess I could God.
Let me jump in and ask a question while you're playing through here. So uh, do your enemies sort of have any kind of um, affinities or weaknesses to things? Like maybe the skull is particularly weak to the axe or to uh, certain magic spells or anything like that in, in the uh, game? No, I don't have anything like that. Mm-hmm. That is something I could do if I were to experience this game. But anyways, now I'm going to just take a quick tour through the... Um... Okay, I saw somebody raise their hand if you want to ask a question. You know, uh, do the enemies have any sort of like thought to their actions or do they just like attack a random target? I, I... I can't hear you. Uh, do the um, do the enemies have any sort of thought behind their actions, or do they just like pick a random target and do a random? Uh, thing? No, it is kind of random. They randomly select if they're going to attack or use magic, and then also randomly select the spell if they use magic. Again, that's something I could potentially implement. So I uh, go into this further. But anyways, let me yeah. just go through my uh, menus real quick. So first, we have the characters, so we can see got all of them stats. Spells you can equip and unequip weapons. Let's go to items, you have consumables, potion. We can use one of those potions, nobody really needs it. We can use these to heal what we need. We got weapons which we can equip. So, this, we compare to our uh, what we have now, it's you can equip it longsword, it's stronger, but it's also heavier, which can increase, uh, decrease our uh, speed stat, our skill stat. Let's go ahead and equip it. Nick and let's equip it on. Anyways, uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be getting through all of this again, so, but I, mean, I do want to show off a few more things. So I have it. It's going to kind of speed through this. So we got dungeon key one. So you can see there's a door here and a door here. It's not for this door, but rather this one here. So, so here we have a uh, pushing block puzzle. So just walk up to the block, press Q, and you can move it and move it onto this button here. And open that door on the bottom. And you push this, and now it seems to be in a position where you can't move any further. So what you want to do is go to a random encounter again. So these are random encounters, right? Uh, that 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 are just being generated as you go. Is that is that correct? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Uh, th- these are random encounters that that you're getting um, as you go through the dungeon. Yes. So you want to go up to this button, and you can reset the uh, box's position. So as well, let's just go over what I, so what I could uh, potentially do with this project going forward. So as I mentioned, as you mentioned, I could definitely improve the. Uh, enemies AI and also give them certain weaknesses or resistances. It's definitely something that could add more depth to the uh, combat system. Additionally, I could uh, add just more enemies because it seems there's only three types of enemies. So that's something I could improve upon. Of course, that'd be a whole process of making a spoiler for that part of the longest part for implementing a new enemy type. Also, a couple other things. There are a couple of glitches in this game that I, I am aware of them, but I don't know how to patch them out just yet. So there's one I'm aware if you kill an enemy, then it's an adjacent enemy will become invisible. It doesn't affect the uh, gameplay at all, it's just that the enemy can't see them anymore. I don't know if you got that one in one that's a little more um, a little more impactful on your gameplay experience is that uh, Neil, for some reason this only affects Neil, is that for some reason, after doing certain actions, I don't know what triggers it, but his attack gets um, uh, greatly nerfed to where he's only doing like 7 damage per attack. Again, I do not know what causes that, but it's Definitely something I want to. If I, if I if I knew how to fix it, I would definitely because I mean, having your having your hard hitting mage hit for seven damage is a lot of your time. I 
I think what we can do now is just continue to play here for a minute or two, and and we'll definitely open up for questions right now. Um, and I'll start. So, what inspired you to do the Sokoban style box pushing stuff? Because I, I really think that adds a lot. So, what was kind of your inspiration for that? So, the inspiration for the uh, style of the game. So, I mean, of course, a lot of you know retro JRPGs. One that particularly I based. Uh, some of this project on is, I don't know if you've played it, it's called uh, Golden Sun, it's a uh, RPG on the oh, yes. that, uh, a lot of inspiration because it's kind of, I mean, pretty standard RPG, but it also focuses a lot on uh, overall puzzles in addition to uh, combat, so that's kind of what inspired me to do this. Um, yeah, art style wise, and uh, to some extent the story, although a lot of it I correct myself, actually, well, not, not all the art style, but particularly the uh, battle sprites for the characters. I uh, kind of got some inspiration from uh, Fire Emblems, the GBA Fire Emblems particularly. So if you look at the characters' battle sprites, they can, can maybe see some resemblance. But also, and also the story, some of the beats I, are kind of inspired by uh, Fire Emblem to some extent, but again, a lot of it is also my own story. Because like we were talking about earlier, some people get inspired by to do a story and then build a game around that, which again is maybe not the best thing to do, but is I'm kind of guilty of that. Right. And so, uh, Elijah, you have your hand up to ask a question? Yeah, can you hear me? I'm going to speak up if you want to ask, just because the game is kind of still. I just turned my mic on. Can you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, okay. I can hear you. So, uh, this isn't as much a question as a, I guess, a tip, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. So I do really like the aesthetic of the game. Uh, something I think that might help uh, is that in, you have this in the overworld where the background stuff uh, have a lot softer lines and the foreground elements and things you can interact with are solid black lines, but in the battles you have everything solid black. Kind of doesn't have a separation between a uh, foreign background. I would just carry that over into the battles as well. Just make the battle backgrounds have the soft outlines so that you can tell what's like an interactable object and what's just decoration. That makes sense? Okay. Yeah, Other than that, I do really like the aesthetic, though. Thank you. All right, and uh, any any other questions on this? All right, so let me just say there's, uh, you know, this is definitely one of those projects where there's obviously a ton of detail work that has to go into getting all these fiddly menus to work right and all the stats to, to function and... Uh, believe me, because I, you know, I wrote an RPG template that a lot of you have used. I, I sort of know uh, uh, how much pain uh, that can be. So, uh, really wonderful project, and uh, thank you so much. Also, one thing that I just did. Uh, so, there's a pushing block puzzle, and there were two buttons that you could have put it on. And mm -hmm. basically, you put the block on one of the buttons, and it'll block off the door. So, it's basically just like a pick a pick a path, and you get two different items from that. So. Just kind of some, uh, some cool thing I decided to implement. Yeah, I love the block pushing stuff. The Sokoban L elements, I think, add add a whole lot uh, uh, to the game. Uh, definitely, the environmental stuff's very Zelda esque. Uh, definitely dig it. Um, all right, Andrew, is there any last second things you want to add here before we go to the next presenters? Uh, am I, am I uh, out of time? Should I uh, go ahead and quit it? Because I'm pretty close to the end, but if you want me to stop, I can. If you have, uh, if you're within a minute, I, I think we can keep going. Do you think you're within a minute or so? A minute. Uh, yeah, if I really book it, I think I could. Okay, let's go ahead and check out the ending. It's cool. So we'll go ahead and, and see the whole thing. Do you have a website where you can check it? Yes, I do. You can, I'll put it in the chat afterwards, but you can uh, download this uh, demo from it. Now we have the uh, boss battle, and it's uh, fairly easy. One thing I might want to change, this is something that one of my uh, playtesters mentioned, is that I might want to rebalance it, because well, the uh, combat, if you don't know what you're doing, can be, uh, as I've seen from him, a bit challenging, whereas the boss is fairly easy at this point. So, so But that has the advantage of putting legs through it a lot quicker for this, for the purposes of this. 
one thing I'm going to do, just because I haven't shown it off yet, is use a PS now. You know, I'm from the boss. He's pretty standard. I really do like this ending. <laughs> And that's it. All right. Well, we'll do a second round of applause. Thank you, uh, Andrew, for getting all that in. Um, and great job on this project. I know you put a lot of work. Sorry if I went it. a little over time. Uh, we're still good. Um, we're we're we had 15 minutes of padding, and we've almost used all of it, but not quite all of it yet. So go ahead and looks like you've stopped your share already. And now yeah, it's just, time. Because some, somebody asked me to like, oh, sure. real quickly post my uh, website in the uh, chat, so you can go check it out. Okay, go ahead and uh, do that while Studio Mage begins their presentation. Mm -hmm. What's up, guys? Hold on, let me see if I can get the... So I will first be showing off just our website real quick, and then I will hand it off to Emily to actually show off the build. So if I can, let me just get this um, share going. Thank you, Austin. <laughs> cool. All right, so everyone can see that, right? I'm coming through. Nice, okay, cool. So uh, yeah, we are Mage Studios and this is our senior capstone project, Sonata Theory. And um, this team, Team consists of, and just uh, to introduce myself, I'm Isaiah, I'm the producer of this team, and then uh, we do have most of the team here, so if they could go ahead and introduce themselves briefly. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, uh, hi, I'm Devon, and I focus on art direction for the game, so um, that pretty much is just looking at the, the overworld and what drives the visual narrative and color palettes and things like that. Um, so we have some great artists on the team and Isabel's here. So. Yeah. Hey guys, um, I'm Isabel and I'm a character concept artist on the team. And uh, later when we're showing off our demo, you guys will see lots of character work done by me, some character concept art done by uh, me and the other character concept artists who I'm not sure I don't think he's here, but Braz is also on our team. He's also a character mm -hmm. concept artist, so a mix of artwork you'll see later. And uh, our lead designer, Emily, I think is here too. Yeah, I'm the design lead, so I do the level design, the scripting, and as well as any extra implementation that needs to be done for the game. For sure. Yeah, and then this is our game, Sonata Theory. So it's this uh, puzzle 2D slash 3D adventure game with 2D characters in a 3D environment, very Paper Mario-esque. And then you play as Cadence, this uh, quirky, musically inclined individual who finds herself trapped in the falsetto of this beautiful, magical alternate universe. And as Cadence, you sort of explore, solve puzzles, meet interesting characters. Uh, and investigate to uncover the secrets behind the falsetto and while you're here in this very Undertale-esque adventure. So uh, just to give you guys just a, a brief, like a sneak peek of what the build could entail, these are some uh, screenshots of our characters. Um, this, is, this is Cadence, and then this is uh, a little bit of our how our environment looks. And then we have our environment concept art here as well. Um, Devon would probably be the best person to speak upon this, so you can go ahead. Yeah, for sure. Um... So the initial thought for um, this overworld was 
having kind of like these parallel worlds where, you know, it's almost like an upside down is what I like to think of it as. Um, you have this normal home world, which is very warm. Um, not exactly bleak, but um, I suppose to our main character it would be. Um, and on the other hand, you have this very magical flip side world where everything is almost the same, but just, you know, you have these like bioluminescent plants that grow everywhere and they are very natural to this world. Um, whereas in our world, you think that this would be, you know, indicative of destruction and wear and tear, but these are very natural and it's, it's very lively. Um, and you know they they drive the magic in this world, so yeah. Nice, yeah. And Devon's done an awesome job, sort of just establishing our art direction and our color palette. And it, as you can see, it looks gorgeous. So, uh, and then we also have our character concept art. So this is Cadence, as well as uh, some other characters that you will see here on the on the slideshow. So I could go ahead and hand this off to Isabel, since uh, this was her part of the game. Yeah, so uh, the general vibe of, you know, this environment that we're creating is um, in an apartment building, right? And we're sort of pulling from that New York kind of, uh, like, urban scene, lots of close buildings and stuff, and just sort of thinking, like, what would a cool, like, teenager maybe wear <laughs> in the city, you know? And um, these these characters are very musically inclined, and Cadence, the main character, a big feature about her is that she's wearing, you know, her big headphones. She's just in it. She's into music. And I just imagine that that's what she's, you know, seen doing walking down the street. She's got her book bag, you know, just a very relaxed uh, kind of character. And so from Cadence, who is my first character concept for this team, uh, we sort of built other characters around that. And with Devon's like direction, um, everybody has their own personality and you know, Sonata getting scrolled through here. He's not exactly the same as Cadence, but, you know, very relaxed, kind of cool. Everyone's sort of wearing joggers and sneakers. Um, and then there is sort of, as Isaiah slides through, um, you do get a bit of the character concept art for the falsetto version of the NPCs. And um, they're very different, uh, not really in streetwear, but more uh, sort of woodland creature um kind of RPG style, I think I'd say, uh, costumes. And, and that is Braz's work, who isn't here today. Um, but we wanted to really highlight that difference between um, the real world and the falsetto, in, in especially their outfits and stuff. Yeah, for sure. And then um, thank you so much as well. As well as also an amazing job. And then uh, another team member that we have to um, Give credit to is Rob. Rob is also helping us out with audio and music. So um, uh, we do have original music for the game and uh, as well as uh, some some voice acting as well, sound effects. And uh, all of that we did through the help of Rob. So just a big thank you to Rob. And then for Emily, Emily actually designed the systems and she actually, uh, since she is our integrator, she's the person in charge of sort of uh, keeping the build and just some um, sort of updating it over time so we can go ahead and I will stop my share here and then I could hand it off over to Emily to actually showcase the systems and what we actually have in the build, so. All right, let me get this ready. Hopefully it works out okay. Can you guys hear that? <laughs> All right, cool. Hopefully I'll still be able to hear you guys. <laughs> it is a little loud through the game. <laughs> But we'll pop into this demo, and this demo is um, available to play right now on our website. So if you guys are interested in downloading it and giving it a shot for yourself, there are currently three different endings to our demo. And there will be, I don't know if I should spoil how many endings, but there will be different standard endings for our game, as well as a couple of secret endings for the game. So, you know... Feel free to check it out and see which ones you can find in the demo. Let me turn off that texture streaming warning. Uh, we'll optimize in the future. And maybe... Bump the audio again? 
There we go. So here's what it's looking like in our environment. The story is you wake up in the falsetto. Uh, you kind of don't really remember how you got here. You just kind of stumbled in here. Cadence is a little clumsy that way. What's up? What's the matter? So we meet this first character here. Um, nice. <laughs> and then throughout these dialogue choices, you the goal is if this is your goal, to befriend these people. If you don't want to be friends with them, you don't have to. In fact, you could be a little bit mean towards them if you want. But we want to be very friendly, um, at least right now. Really, Cadence? Or we could upset them <laughs> and kind of annoy them with that. <laughs> but there's always a positive option, a kind of neutral option and then a negative option. So I don't know why the buttons really? are glitching out like that. <laughs> so Sonata, basically to sum up our introduction to him, he's like, you're the only person I've seen kind of wander around here, just like pop in from your world into mine. So you're probably the only person that can help me find a cure. Sonata's very sick for reasons we don't quite know yet. Oh, what are you doing, Cadence? But all we know is he needs our help to find a cure. And because it's an adventure, we just go along with it. Then we also have a journal to help keep track of different stuff. Like our main objective is finding falsetto blood for the first part of Sonata's cure. But we can talk to different characters along the way. Let me talk to Isaiah's character in here. Because they're Wait. one of my faves. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I see you like milk as well. I like you already. And all of their voice lines essentially are just them talking about how much they love milk. <laughs> in fact, their negative voice lines are like how disappointed they are that Cadence does not like milk. <laughs> oh, jolly right, little one. But we have a bunch of NPCs in the game. Um, we won't be able to show them all off in this demo today, and we won't even show them off all in the video that I have up on our website. <laughs> <laughs> the laugh always gets me. <laughs> but your interactions with these characters are really the heart of this game whether you choose to befriend them or whether you choose to kind of threaten them <laughs> throughout the whole game that's up to you and it does affect your play style and it does play into these different endings you can get in the full game so whether or not you want to be friendly or whether you want to be a little bit rude you see we maxed out our friendship bar with isaiah or not Isaiah, Zay, I should say. No correlation whatsoever. Because we maxed out our friendship bar with them, then in future chapters, they may be a little more helpful towards us. For now, we're going to go look. I'm going to just go straight to where I know the falsetto blood is and kind of bypass all of this since we are on a time limit here. But we see all this blood outside the door, and we're like, I bet someone in there has some fresh blood for us. So by pressing F, we can enter this focus state. Cadence has a soundboard with her that she uses to play music when she's stressed. But the thing about the falsetto is that it's full of magic, and this magic is used through magic. Or not magic, through music. So... Sonata told us to check out the destruction spell if we need it, so I'll go ahead and play that. Now we blow up that door, we can walk inside. And this man has a bloody nose! <laughs> so they could probably help us. Um... I'm going to go ahead and threaten no. them throughout this conversation to see what happens. <laughs> so we're going to kind of freak them out 
another way to play that is an easy solution to getting the blood is being very friendly. What are you talking about? Towards Bras here, right? If you want something from him, you should befriend him and ask for a favor in return. Another thing is, if you don't befriend him right away in this conversation, you can do some errands for him, like you could pick up some laundry for him. He, uh, he has a load in the laundry room on the main floor, a little pro gamer tip, and if you go pick that up and bring that back to him, it will max out his friendship meter right away. And you can do that before talking with him or after. No way. But we're going to continue freaking him out here. What are you talking about? So we chose the worst possible answers. Uh, no friendship points for him. But now the question is, how do we get the blood to advance? So I'll actually ask you guys, and the first answer I'll see, I'll do. Um, do we want to go run some errands for him to befriend him? Or do we want to tap into our magic supply here? Uh, this won't be available in the full game at this point, but I do have the spells included um, in this demo for you guys to try out. And you are able to use it in the level if you haven't memorized at this point in the game from like a second playthrough or something like that. So we have a charisma spell we could use to manipulate him into being our friend or we could use the destruction spell on him again because we see there's a light right over his head that we might be able to knock over. So I'm trying to see the chat here. I don't know where the chat is. It look uh it's overwhelmingly magic. It's everyone is saying magic. <laughs> Everyone, well what type of oh I see a lot of destruction. <laughs> so uh Gosh, you guys really want to give Bras a hard time here. So we'll just use this, and that's a little visual indicator. Is if something glows red, you could use destruction magic on it. Well, our journal's updated. Looks like we got the blood! Congratulations, you guys! <laughs> you did it! So, we'll leave him be, but there are several different ways your encounter with Bras can go, and then for the Charisma spell, you can use that on any NPC you see. Um, and then there is one more spell, and since we've already used up two of the spells, might as well use up that last spot. For each chapter, you'll have three uses of magic. So let's go ahead and show off the Levitation spell. Also, so you guys can see the really cute artwork that Isabel did for this levitation sprite. And also, we can check out the garden area that Devon did in his art pass. So you can use the levitation spell to access areas that you're probably not supposed to be at right now. Oh, but um, I have planned ahead for that so that you guys can get to it without breaking the game completely. But now we're all out of magic and the thing about this game is there will always be a non-magic solution to anything so you could get through the entire game without using magic once if you're determined enough. But if you do need the magic or you're just curious about using the magic then it is there for you guys to use. Whether or not you use it depending on story consequences that's what's going to set everyone's experiences apart. Hey. It's an so we got the blood. No need for further questions, um, since we got it in a non-violent way, we'll say. And it looks like for our next chapter, the next things we need are milk and pickles for some reason. Why my world? Because there's a different type of magic in the real world. And that makes pickles and milk function differently. <laughs> so we're going to go back through the portal for this next chapter. And that is where our demo will end. Seriously, the full yes. game will have a chapter where you go and do this milk and pickle quest in the real world. And then we'll have a final chapter where you have to use your relationships and the skills you've built over the first half of the game. 
and you have to use them to I don't want to spoil too much, but it all kind of comes together and combines in our last chapter. So we'll go ahead and go over to the portal here. And that's where our demo ends, so I'll go ahead and say we got the chaotic magic ending. We used all of our magic slots. In fact, we used the destruction spell twice, so it's definitely chaotic. So there are two other endings. There's a standard ending you can get for this demo, and there's also the non-magic ending you could get for the demo. And the full game will have plenty more of that. But we're hoping to still release this in May 2021. <laughs> so like two, about two months, I guess. That's kind of close, but that is the plan. <laughs> All right, awesome. So I think we probably have some questions queued up. I see Elijah, you have your hand up. So why don't you go ahead and start with your question? Sorry, I did the same thing he did. I just left it up. Oh, okay. Uh, I do that too. <laughs> Anyone have questions though? Uh... Uh, Yorgos. What was kind of the inspiration for this game idea? Because I really like the visual aesthetics and the gameplay looks really fun, you know, messing around with people. Yeah, so when we were coming up with this idea, we formed our team first instead of uh, having a concept and getting people around that. And what happened is half of our team is very, very talented artists. And then we've got Isaiah, that's a great producer that loves story games. And then there's me who uh, just figured out they like to do level design and we needed something kind of smaller scale to handle on my own um, and needed a lot of personal inspiration. So what we found worked for all of us was actually Paper Mario, I think was the biggest original influence because we have a bunch of great 2D artists, but Paper Mario has those sprites in a 3D environment and also, or at least depending on the game you play, most of them tell a very, very compelling and fun story. So that ended up being the original inspiration, but um, we've taken inspiration from um, plenty of other things. Devon, if you have any input on the art inspiration, um, any extra references, then you could hop in. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you nailed it uh, pretty much because this one thing I really like about what we have is this, you know, charming look like everything is kind of like a moving sticker or a moving picture. And I think that's, you know, the strong point for, you know, our art here. Um, so yeah, I think that simplicity, um, there's like beauty in that. And it's, you know, it keeps it fun and light, which is pretty much on par with the theme of our game. So, yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah, I really love the you know the sprite design you did you guys did for the characters. Yeah, Isabel's work looks really good in game. All right, cool. Any other any other questions? Thank you, Yorgos. Okay, I'll just I'll just make a comment here. Uh, one of the things that surprised me, and I think is a cool learning thing. So remember, this part of this is all about like how can we learn from each other, you know, is you may have noticed, and by the way, I will say everyone should just be aware, um, everyone's games are running like choppy through WebEx, unfortunately, uh, that's been kind of universal. So uh, I would definitely highly recommend getting your ghost's game, checking out Andrew's work, downloading this, because then, then you'll be able to run it, you know, uh, a little more properly. But the audio did come through nicely, and the voice acting um, you know, it was, as I recall, uh, Emily's idea to do what, what I think you called animate grunts, I think, uh, right? So instead of trying to, like, write up a whole bunch of dialogue and then trying to kind of draft randos on campus to deliver long, dramatic expositions, you heard, like, these sort of a greeting sound, a, oh, you said something negative sound or, or whatever, right? And I thought that really just added a tremendous amount of life to the game, and it's it's really quite effective, because then you're not asking like your voice actors to do something that is beyond them, right? You could probably get a rando to say, 
oh, hello, how are you, and have it be okay. And actually, I think they did it in my audio class. I actually think they did a lot better than that. Uh, and I think that added a lot. So that's something that I think everyone should take take from that. There's some cool ways to use voice acting to enhance your uh, production values easily. Um, okay, any other uh, comments or questions before we move on? Okay, so uh, like I said before in the chat, we're, we're now officially running a little late, but I think it's okay. Um, I think, you know, uh, we're all probably good. It is a reading day. Thank you for showing up on a reading day, by the way, to do this. So if we get to about 8, 10-ish, I think we'll be all right. Uh, okay, so we have another senior capstone to look at here, uh, Nitty Grit Games. Uh, so whoever is doing the presenting for that, please go ahead. Okay. Can you guys hear me? I am having, like, my WebEx has been super laggy, so we're going to see if it works. <laughs> I can hear you just fine, Joey. Yep. And like Rob said, it's been choppy for everyone, so if it's just a video that you've been noticing, it might be yeah. just because of that. We are Nitty Grit Games, and Michael, wanna okay. help. I guess we can meet the team. <laughs> so, Michael, if you want to introduce yourself, I guess. All right. um, I'm Michael Stats. I'm the main programmer, and I'm also helping out with the UI development in this game. Um, I'll let Anthony go. <laughs> Just kind of let everyone go down the line, because I know most of us are here. Yeah, uh, I'm Anthony, and I'm the animator for the game. Um, Madison is not here. Um, She's our um, UX slash UI designer. Um, and, um, that's it. and I'm Joey. I'm the lead artist on the team. I am Austin, and I'm doing all the sounds and probably some light programming, but Michael's taking care of most of that for us. So. Okay, so just a real quick rundown about our game. Our game, as you can probably tell from all the pictures, is named Dunebug. Um, and Dunebug is an action-adventure survival game. It's from a top-down perspective. Some of the inspirations behind it are like games like Subnautica, where there are survival aspects, but we kind of focus more on exploration and a bit on story. Even though it's for a demo, it's going to be very much implied and not like there's not going to be like a nice grand story like Subnautica eventually had or um, other games like that. Um, the game takes place in this kind of dunes desert area of an alternate earth where bug people are in place of humans. Um, so it's just kind of them living in it play and the world there is now in wastes and kind of falling apart and your goal is to kind of play as this dung beetle and eventually get your way off the planet um, using the ship that is pointed out to you through this um, NPC called the Gypsy, who's uh, a moth, though you don't see him in the game currently. Um, so currently the status that we're on the game, we got a lot to complete still, um, but we got a lot decently done so far. Um, we're in the process of implementing our sounds now. Um, we need to finish one of our last zones. We got a lot of different zones on the map. Called this one is the the last one to finish is the test site, which is a nuclear test site where you have kind of like a fake suburban prop town that's been blasted by a nuke. Um, we need to recreate our gunner model and just everything to deal with that gunner enemy still needs to basically be done. Um, in terms of like the art side, because we ran into a hiccup with that, which we'll go on to with what's going bad. <laughs> and then creating, um, right now we're also in the process of creating all of our UI, um, along with whatever systems that comes with. We have some of them in, some of them not. We're still going through it. Um, we also um, need to animate the gunner model when it's made. Um, we need to make a save game system, which I already have. Um, mocked like i know how to do that just need some time to get it done it'll be like one more last things um we need to create our radio system um which is it's kind of like a combination of a tutorial that follows you and the fallout uh franchises system 
So the music comes from there. Um, eventually, probably not for this demo, we'll have different music that you guys can unlock and find throughout the map. Um, and then there, the Gypsy Moth is the one who runs it, and he will basically every once in a while chime in with some sort of like, oh, maybe you should do this, or oh, found this. Like, if we ever need him to talk to you, he would chime in through that. Um, and then, of course, refining and balancing, like some of the gunplay still needs um, like the stats need to be balanced and other things that just need to get refined and balanced along the way. Um, and all of this will hopefully bring us to a solid demo state. Um, so what is going well? Currently, the art and world design, uh, I wanted to just give a big thing to Joey and Anthony and all of them. Um, it's doing really good. Our team synergy has been really on top. I feel like we've all been pretty good about um, communicating with each other and just not stepping on each other's toes. Um, and on top of that, currently, even though we have a lot of work caught up on ourselves, we're still on schedule and expect it to um, meet our acceptance criteria for the capstone coming up. And I think like three weeks is like the deadline. I need to double check that. Yep. <clears throat> So if you can hear me, uh, if I'm not lagging. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so our characters that we have so far in the game, uh, we have the main character who are, you, you play as is the dung beetle named Dusty. I guess that's my code name for him. And then we have our enemies that attack, will attack your scrap ball. Uh, they're just like ants. And so right now we have the runner ant that'll run up and attack your scrap ball and take a piece of scrap metal off of it and run away. And then we have the gunners who... We kind of came into a hiccup, but now we're gonna use, we're gonna substitute the runner ants for the gunner ants. And hopefully, it'll work out. Um, and then we have the gypsy moth who lives inside his trailer and is like your uh, he's like a shopkeeper. So you like spend your scrap that you have in your ball to buy things from him. Um, we have a little like intro to the game. I kind of sketched out. Um, it's kind of like you go to the gypsy van when you come into town and he's like, oh, clean up the scrap. And then he teaches you how to roll into a ball. You bring it back to him and he gives you like a radio that you use and the gun that you start with. And then he tells you about a ship that crashed in the desert that he drove to and found. And so he wants you to go check it out so you can live in there. <laughs> so um, right now, this is the map so far it's like a big we wanted like a big open world map so we tried to make it big but like not too overly massive um you can see it's all divided up and i that's for the world composition that i'll get to in a bit and next i just have i kind of have screenshots but if i think i can just go in game yeah <laughs> we had screenshots in case we couldn't go in game for whatever reason is my Unreal showing? Yep. Yep. Okay. Right now, this is so right here is the Gypsy Camp. A little rundown trailer park. I just want to point out too, all of these are original models made by Joey and textured by Joey. Thank you. <laughs> I, know, I just want to point that out. It's not. It's it's really good work. And so, like, there's resources that you can collect around the map. Um, Main one in the sand dune areas are these crash satellites that you can go up and break for scrap. So you can pick up your scrap metal. And then if you Q, you can make a ball and start pushing it around. And you can shove it with melee to get like this. So if you if I get it stuck in this little ditch over here, I'm able to push it out. With relative ease, um, I don't. I think the raid events with the ants it, is kind of broken right now. I'm yeah. not sure. Well, the raid. So currently for testing, I just had the raid events happen immediately upon ball spawn. But the gypsy camp is a safe area, so if you spawn the ball yeah. there, they just can't spawn. So yeah, if you put it, yeah, if you put them out there, they should spawn. And they should have like print strings going off here. Yeah. These there should be. That's my thought. Okay, here. We'll just have to fix that. Yeah, I can do it because it works on mine. It must have been something that yeah. got merged in wrong. Yeah. Um, if you go, 
if you want to be very quick to see if there's a fix, you can go into the top, uh, the character blueprint. I might know what's wrong real quick. Do you want to like real quick second? Okay, scroll out. Go to yeah, raid events right there. It's on hooks. Yep, that's what it is. Go up there. So just hook that top of it up to the set timer, and then do it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's live game dev, ladies and gentlemen. Live. I was like, <laughs> I, I, I remember that being a thing, so I didn't know that got merged in or not, that unhook. So no, we get a raid event happening. Yeah. So there's a gunner right now, but it's kind of broken. Like, oh, no, you're using a shotgun. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Joey, you made the wrong mm -hmm. choice. So we got a couple different guns. We got a shotgun, a rifle, and a pistol in so far. Each one has kind mm -hmm. of different ways they play. Um... You currently have the aiming system, which is hard to see with how this game. <laughs> kind, of, uh, kind of choppy it can be, but the aiming system is inspired by Project Winner. If you guys know that game where you hold right click to um, tighten your aim, and in that cone, bullets will randomly spawn. Um, and the rifle will be like, in all the other guns, but the shotgun is a singular bullet that spawns in that range. Um, and then you got a recoil system that it adds to. Um, your uh, randomness, basically, it just forces it out a bit, so you can't spam your shots, or else you're gonna be, be just shooting all over the place and hitting nothing. Um, as you saw, you had the two enemies. Oh, oh no. Uh-oh. Oh, that's audio. Oh, you. Austin. <laughs> no, it's not my fault. Hello, errors, my old friend. <laughs> yeah. Looks like a bunch of just bad casts, um, none references, but we can easy fixes. Just need some validations. Um, so, with it, um, as you saw, I had the looter ants that run to your inventory to steal scrap off of it. Once they steal scrap off of it, they run away, and if they're off screen for so long, they'll get away. Um, you had the, and then you had the gunner and ants that always look for a uh, the closest point to them that's in range of like a certain range of you in line of sight of the player. And if you get too close, you try to back off a bit and stuff like that. So they got a little bit of AI in them. That That's just very quick run down of that type of stuff. And those raid events will happen kind of like random events in RPGs. They'll just every so often on a timer, on a random timer, it'll just be like, oh, it's raid event. <laughs> Protect your scrap. Um, okay. Well, here's going to be the test site. Blah, blah. Yeah, just, I'm just showing the environment off, I guess. Yeah. There's like a crystal. Yeah. Forest that we have, kind of like a just a lot of obstacles, and then there's um, some crystals that you can mine, like this one right here. Um, and then we have this tar field here where you can where you're able to get oil for your ship. Yeah, and you get to slow down yeah. from those hazards, the big spears yeah. right now, the tar pits. You got piping to kind of um, make you have to go around and navigate through that. Mm -hmm. Um, can you go back to the gold mine because it was really choppy and it passed over the gold mine? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> we have this little gold mine. We'll let it go through it and mine some gold for your electronics inside of the ship. It'll be able to fix the ship up. And uh, these are resource nodes that also will respawn on timers based off if they're been off the screen. So, like, nothing should nothing should respawn on the screen for you in terms of these resource nodes they have a couple other functionality built in them if we want like random procedural stuff but mm -hmm. for now they're pretty much offset locations i guess that's pretty much it <laughs> but yeah i was about to pop in and say now would be a great time to start fielding questions i would i would say yeah, yeah. um um is there any questions anyone has? Um, I, I can't see who raised their hand virtually first. So, Kenny, why don't you go ahead and start? Yeah. Um, yeah. First off, just like awesome work. This looks amazing. Um, I was just curious if you guys have uh, played or heard of the game Helldivers. Um, it's it's like a very similar um, like gameplay wise. And also the environment is pretty similar. It's also like a top down. Um, and a lot of the... What? Uh, combat hell divers um, yeah hell divers it's by the people that made Mac divers. a lot of the combat and the environment seems um very like inspired by it uh, in a very good way so it's it's really cool to see 
I'll definitely look into the hat. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Yeah, definitely. I, I've, I've never heard of it, so I'm just, <laughs> hopefully. It... And uh, I think Yorgos, you had a question as well. Yeah, when are you guys planning on uh, releasing this game? Because I really want to play it. <laughs> so currently, for the end of Capstone, we plan to have this demo done. Um, or I'll just have the two base enemies, the map you saw, and like just some base stuff you can play through. Um, for an actual alpha release, we don't know what will happen with that, um, because it will happen when we all graduate. So we don't know how we are are all going to continue and if we do. But we have a lot of ideas, such as, of course, different enemy types, wandering enemies, um, collectibles, and hidden locations. A lot more guns they can craft, so you can only buy one gun, craft one gun, and you get one gun immediately upon starting. And because we got, like, upgrade systems and other stuff that we're planning, but we just... Don't don't know how everything will go, so it's a to be determined. <laughs> cool, yeah. I, mean, I just want to say it looks really awesome and really fun Thanks. to play. So, and uh, I'll go ahead and ask a, a question. Um, so, all right, like I see this uh, super cool environment, um, and and obviously we all recognize uh, Joey that you know you you were kind of a driving force behind that and everything. Um, did you kind of do the usual level design process, like a white box, like paper design, white box, kind of test the gameplay? How did that work for you? Uh, uh, maybe Joey didn't hear that, or maybe he's oh. muted, or... Uh, did that question come oh. through? Uh, wait. Yeah, I think I didn't know when you ended though, because it was all like coming in choppy. <laughs> so, uh, right. Okay. But, so, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So we did. Like, I did. When it came to like level design, I started with like a paper map of like where I wanted things to be. Like the gypsy camp was here. Like, but before it was a lot smaller. Like this was all like it was like a little bit. Like this was all cut off over. Like the test site was closer in. Like everything was closer. And so I kept increasing the size because I wanted it to seem like more like it wouldn't it would we wanted it to seem like it took a while to get to places. And as for like the actual like like I guess this like crystal forest, we, there wasn't any like white boxing because like to me it was just like okay it's like natural there's there's gonna be crystals everywhere and like grass everywhere I don't, I don't know like I didn't really the only thing I really like thought of beforehand was like the gypsy camp and i don't know, like all of this is like modular stuff so like i could always read arrange it if it had to be but like so like these things are all just like pieces that i put together the, yeah the, the main form of white box <laughs> yeah sorry the main form of white boxing we went through is mainly just we had the map um we planned out like the areas and sections and then we just joey went in with the landscape tool and kind of blocked out using that the general area and layout of the map in engine and then after that we've just been adding props straight into it yeah so let me comment on that because i think this is a good takeaway a lot of what you're seeing here um and and the reason why i think and you can correct me if i'm wrong on this there's something about using the strength of a game engine uh, and obviously, in my opinion, one of the strongest tools Unreal has is the, the landscape tool because you can make uh, like a huge, vast area look good kind of at a base level right away, especially when you get like multi-layered materials in there or whatever. And then once you kind of litter it with props, it, it just builds up, you know, very efficiently a large environment. Do you think that's been true for your production? I'm sorry you cut out there for me. Oh, maybe stats heard it. Did you hear what uh, yeah. I comment? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I would say so. Yeah, it has. Yeah, and I think it's just a really smart use of of the landscape tool, um, and and kind of how you're peppering it with your custom models. But the landscape tool is doing a lot of heavy lifting um, to make like this pretty big environment uh, quickly. So it's it's a smart. Yeah kind of, you know, methodology, I would say. Yep. Um, and we have had iteration, iterations within our map where the initial map size are like, oh, maybe make this area bigger. Oh, connect the mines to the crystal forest, you know, do this and that. So 
and it's allowed for that process to be really fast because yeah. you just go in and sculpt it out. Right. All right. Very cool. Very cool. Everyone. Is there any last uh, questions here uh, before we move on? Okay. Is, or go ahead, staff. Uh, I was just going to say if there is none, we didn't get to these slides, but just to point out two things that I just want to share with everyone just because it was really helpful to us um, to look into. World composition is what we use for um, level streaming. Since we have an open world level, we can't do traditional level streaming really. Um, so if you're lo looking into that, just you know, look up world composition. There's a lot of documentation. And then there's um, environmental query systems. EQS for the AI and a lot of other stuff such as response and you can do like fog of war and vision you can do a lot with it um, that is also really big but it's experimental but there's also a lot of the documentation for it so I just want to point those out to anyone interested oh and by the way I'll say and I see your hand up Sophia so I'll, de I'll, I'll definitely get to you I do want to make one more comment too for for everyone since we have such a wide array of, of folks here, different experience levels. I think what you're also seeing here in this project is the fact that uh, I think Joey and Stats and Austin uh, have all gone out and done uh, the C the CRLT, I'm saying that right, I think, internship, the Serious Games Company in Lafayette. Uh, and so when you combine Purdue Senior with the internship and all the skills from taking all the classes and, and all that, uh, and some of it's like luck of the draw of your team composition, right? Like you're getting, it's actually rare to see a team get, oh, you have an environment artist and someone that can do programming and someone to do sound. Um, you know, usually a team will kind of be missing some ingredient, right? It's one of those things in our curriculum we're trying to think about. How can we make that, you know, not happen so much? It might, you know, uh, having teams be more balanced because you have a balanced team and you're seeing kind of the result of that too. So there's a lot of good things going on here. Uh, so you should feel good about uh, your progress. Uh, Sophia, you had a question. Oh, okay. Yes, you, <laughs> did you have a question? There we go. Now you guys can probably hear me. Yep. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to know how you guys did the sedimentary rock look on the borders of oh, the map. Joey, did you hear that? Yes. Okay. okay. It's like how it's like, like the lines. Yeah. Um. So, the way I did that was. Here, let me edit. So for that, I have I t like made a texture in Substance Designer, and did this thing called a world aligned texture, which so what it does is it projects the texture on the like each side and the top of the texture uh, of the object. Sorry, and so I was able to project the lines on the sides of the meshes, and then add like a sand on the top. Oh, and that's then, so cool. So that's like, that's what gave this like, so you can see like, it's not really, like it's like sand on top. And then if I were to take this rock and like rotate it, you can see the texture moves. Like uh -huh. it stays in place, the texture does, but the object moves around it. So it's okay. an interesting find. Oh, that's so cool. All right, we are definitely uh, definitely running late now. Um, so, which is no, that's okay. It's and, and, and part of it. This is only the second time I've done this, so I'm already thinking about next year and how I'm going to structure uh, this. But we're only 15 minutes late, so no no huge deal. So let's go ahead and, and wrap things up here. Obviously, give a round of applause to uh, Nitty Grit Studios uh, for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. WebEx applause always sounds funny. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. So um, next up, uh, we have, again, uh, last, uh, the last two presenters, both individual projects. Um, and I'm really curious about this one from Elijah uh, because I, I think it's the one I know the least about. So uh, I'm a complete blank slate here. So Elijah, go ahead and uh, uh, take over once they're done with their share. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out this. 
Yeah, it's like in the They're upper middle. Big stop shit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm a big. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, I thought Kenny was before me. That may have been true in, in one iteration of the schedule I had. It, it doesn't really matter. So who would prefer to go now? Um, if he's ready, I got to pull myself up. I was expecting him to go first. Oh, okay. Uh, Kenny, are you ready to go? Uh, yeah, yeah. In that case, I guess I can go. Um, All right. Take it over. All right. Can you share my screen? All right, how are we looking? Yep, you're looking good. Awesome. Okay, yeah, what's up, everyone? Um, so I'm Kenny Park. I'm a sophomore here at Purdue. Um, I don't actually have a project I'm working on right now that I wanted to share. Uh, so I decided it would be fun to kind of, you know, revisit one of my older projects. Um, so this is Duck Warfare, a post-mortem. I'm going to be talking very fast, by the way, because, like, I usually talk fast, and I'm also very excited slash nervous, so just letting you know. Uh, yeah, so um, this is a mobile game that I made uh, back in my freshman and sophomore year of high school. Um, it was in development for around a year and three months, uh, and I put it up for $1 on uh, both the mobile stores, and it was made in Unity. Um, yeah, so as far as gameplay goes, uh, you know, if you just look at these screenshots here, um, I think you'll pretty much understand it immediately. Basically, um, you uh, you control some troops on the left side. Yeah, definitely new grounds. Um, yeah, so you uh, you play as the ducks and you control uh, the troops and you basically just send them over to the right side and then um, the enemies send them over to the left side. And then once you blow up the enemy base, you win the level, um, pretty simple. Uh, as far as the story goes, um, so it's the story is basically only there to um, allow me to like make other areas um, and have it kind of make sense. So um, essentially, an unknown company is trying to like take over your park. Uh, so naturally, you have to use uh, violence and lethal force in order to prevent that from happening. Um, so you know what this game lacks in uh, originality as far as gameplay goes. I would say um, hopefully it, it's made unique through like the style and the humor. Um, so let's talk about the development. <laughs> Uh, so this was this is very very touch and go. Um, honestly, it's a miracle that I finished this at all. Um, but basically, uh, one day I was like, I was bored. Um, I think I was sitting in a church sermon, um, and like a good Christian boy, you know, I was just doodling because like, yeah. Oh, whoops. Um, and I just thought it would be really funny to uh, like have a game where you control a bunch of ducks and you just like, you know, you go fight stuff. Um, so with that one single dumb idea, I basically sealed my fate for the rest or for the next uh, year and a half almost uh, to dedicate my every waking hour to these ducks. Um, but yeah, it was very much um, what I call like idea adrenaline, which is essentially just um, one second. Yeah, uh, <laughs> which is essentially just, um, you know, like you get an idea, you're like super excited, like that's all you want to do um, and you just jam it out super quickly. Uh, and then that kind of repeats or until you just completely burn out, which has happened a lot. Um, I'm sure y'all can relate. Uh, so, you know, the the uh, the motto for this game is kind of just like, no think, just do. Um, and because of that, uh, the documentation was very, very sparse. Um, you know, it was basically like a notepad that I updated like really infrequently. Um, eventually I just stopped. Uh, and like, I tried spreadsheeting a little bit, but it didn't really go super well. Um, but, you know, I really learned a lot about, um, like what it takes to see a game through from start to finish, uh, because, you know, I have been, um, I've been making, like, I, I started fiddling with game maker back in like my third grade of elementary school. Um, but since then, like it was all pretty small, uh, projects, but this is the first one where, um, you know, I really had to, uh, look at like all those steps it takes like from conception to release um, to really get through it. And it's the first one where I had to like stop relying on, uh, you know, the idea of adrenaline and I really had to get down to the nitty gritty and um, just like work on the more menial stuff. Um, so with that being said, let's talk about some of the stuff that went well. 
Uh, yeah, so definitely, uh, if you can't tell from the way I'm talking about it and also just the general presentation, uh, this is a lot of fun to make. Um, it's definitely, I think, the most fun. Well, maybe not, but it's. I, I had a lot of fun making it um, just because, like, you know, anything I thought of pretty much uh, could be put in the game just because of, like, it's just kind of so out there that, like, you know, I could just do whatever I want. Um, so, you know, for, for one thing, it was just a lot of fun to make. Um, additionally, uh, I think... Uh, I definitely accomplished like, er, like I, I definitely established a style throughout the game, right? Um, so, you know, part of that is just because I can't draw, so it came out, you know, very uh, cartoonish, very childish. But I think in the end, it really played uh, as a benefit because it really matched the overall tone of the game. Um, yeah. Additionally, uh, so I think it's funny. I don't know if y'all will agree with that. You know, um, like this really cringy uh, one-liner you know the ducks are so tough that if they were served at a restaurant they'd probably be sent back uh, just awful stuff like that that probably nobody thinks is funny but i think it is hilarious um yeah <laughs> and then you know this uh like i have a lot of visual um comedy if you'll even call it that uh, i thought that was really funny um so at least to me i think i achieved like some humor in this game um additionally there's a lot of variety in the ducks and enemies um, this is actually where I had a lot of fun um, with like some animations. So it'll probably be pretty laggy on WebEx, but uh, these are just a couple samples of my favorite ones. Um, we have low budget Baymax up in the top right. Uh, we have the dragon duck over here. Um, and the description in the store is just the, it's like the first verse from uh, Dragonborn from Skyrim. So that's fun. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then on top of that, so we have five distinct areas, each with five levels. Um, there's only four pictures here because there isn't an image for the last one. Um, and I think uh, something that really went well is, you know, each area, even though the gameplay is very, very similar, um, each area has like its own set of enemies and dialogue and bosses um, that really make them feel like very distinct areas. Um, and yeah, speaking of bosses, the bosses are one of, uh, you know, my favorite parts of this whole thing uh, because they really contribute to the, uh, like, the elements of like fun and like the small moments that are like really, uh, I think, really shape the game. Um, so, here is a GIF. It will probably be really choppy, uh, but this is one of the bosses. Um, so I would say it's taking inspiration from Borderlands but it's really just ripping it straight off from Borderlands. So, um, you know, like when the Borderlands like bosses come in, uh, you know, they just en like, they enter the arena and like really like uh, with a lot of bravado and, and showmanship. And then it does the, the zoom in with like the text and stuff. Uh, so I thought that'd be really funny to put in there. Um, and then if the GIF wasn't working so well, here's a still frame. Um, and there's plenty of bosses like this. Unfortunately, the other ones I couldn't upload because of the file limit, but um, there's like, there's a horse with a uh, with shades and a katana and he just like busts out of the stable in an explosion. Um, and there, there is uh, in, in the like Wild West area, uh, the final boss is like this very posh, um, high class lady, you know, walks out with like a fan. Um, and then if enough ducks start attacking her, essentially she'll just, she'll whip out a shotgun um, and it'll, it'll go all slow mo, and then she'll just like blast them all away. Um, so just a lot of fun moments like that that I really wanted to incorporate. Um, now, wait. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, now on to the not as good stuff. Um, so given that this was my first, uh, you know, larger project, um, there was a lot of stuff that didn't go so well. Um, a lot of it came from inexperience, uh, and a lot of it was definitely this. Um, you know, this overwhelming urge of like, I need to finish this game. I have to finish the game. Like, I have to do this. Um, so, you know, that definitely uh, put up the blinders for me. So, and it made me make some very questionable decisions, I think, uh, especially towards the end of development. Um, so the things that really suffered the most were um, the balance for one. Uh, so yeah, so I tried balancing the whole game by myself. Um, don't do that. It's, it's really not a good idea because obviously you're going to play very different from your target audience. Um, I didn't even want my friends to like try balancing it because I wanted them to play it 
like for the first time as if they had never played it it's a bad idea just <laughs> I, I really would not recommend you try that um additionally the polish is really lacking uh so like a lot of the ui stuff at different resolutions you can see some clipping here um also these are just all the ducks uh yeah um and then additionally so once i got like the main gameplay uh working you know i kind of just put the blinds up and i didn't really think about ways that i could expand it um and i think there definitely are a lot of ways that i could have expanded it um, but i was just so excited to like uh you know be getting something um out there and released that i just kind of didn't really think about it and um what a lot of the uh progression end up ended up just becoming like well i have to make this game harder right so let's just add more hp to everything because that like that's you know more hp is hard right um that just made it more tedious uh so definitely things like that where i kind of stopped thinking about um like more conceptually about like how i could you know get some more enjoyment and some more um novelty out of the base gameplay um luckily uh i don't think it came to be a huge deal because um like the game is you can beat the game in roughly like two or three hours uh so it's like a pretty quick play um and people from like the reviews didn't seem to really mind that it was like basically they just said it was too easy uh which i agree but uh yeah and then uh, oh i was gonna change that whoops um yeah so the final boss um because i did like this is my first time developing something like this uh i did the ending last which is not a good idea um because you're really rushed at that point because you just want to finish it um so the final boss which you would expect to be like the hardest boss in the game i basically just baited all the players um and essentially i showed them this mech here um and it pops out does this animation i thought it was really cool um and then it's like obviously the players like prepared for this big fight uh but then it's just a gag boss where like one damage from anything and it'll just explode um and it's just a stupid joke about like haha like cheap manufacturers um so like the payoff wasn't even good at all <laughs> but that's what i decided to go with so it, it was a very um anticlimactic and probably not satisfying uh, ending boss fight and on top of that so um in the last level it is revealed that uh the the person who's trying to take over your park is harry the goose um and essentially the ducks bullied harry in high school so harry decides he's going to get revenge by uh building a string of casinos on the parkland um and so <laughs> so instead of like settling it like um grown ducks i suppose and like you know reaching some sort of compromise like obviously that wouldn't really fit with the gameplay uh so instead after the mech blows up it <laughs> it's a quick time event where you like all the ducks just start beating up harry the goose and like they send him to the moon um so it's a it's a really terrific morale or moral of the story um yeah that's yeah okay uh so just some things to take away um you definitely want to have some semblance of a plan um don't do the ending last like i did or that sort of thing will probably end up happening um that's not to say that you should plan out everything though uh, i do think that if you know you leave some gaps uh, to fill in later, like, um, so that you can fill in while you're doing other dev stuff, like the more menial, menial things. Um, it can definitely make development more enjoyable because like you have those more uh, creative tasks to do still, even while you're like mid development. Um, additionally, and this is a big thing for me, um, you can't let like your impatience and your imaginary deadlines dictate your development and your timeline. Um, now, obviously, everyone wants to finish their game or their project. Uh, everyone wants to you know, get it out there and work on something new. Um, and a certain amount of that is certainly helpful. Um, but, you know, for me, it was such a um, such a driving force to just like finish it that you know it ended up making some um, uh, some sacrifices in order to get the game out quicker instead of like. Uh, really polishing it up and focusing on the quality. Uh, and then the last two are pretty similar. So um, I would say you really want to play to your strengths. Um, and what I mean by that is, obviously, you want to make a game that you would want to play yourself. Uh, but like, that's not always the case. Like, I wouldn't 
I probably wouldn't um, like play a game like this now, but I would still be interested in making one just because it's so much fun, right? Um, and if the game wasn't so much fun to make, uh, it definitely would not have you know been finished. Um, there was just so many aspects of it that like uh, that like it really pushed all the right buttons for me as a developer um, that allowed me to you know really get through the the more menial and like not so fun parts of development. Um, yeah, and so then my final point is essentially, um, you know, you're making games because you like it. Uh, if you didn't like making games, but you were still making games, um, you would just really have to hate yourself. Uh, but since that's not the case, you know, we're all here to have fun and to do something that's, um, you know, just fulfilling to ourselves. And I think a lot of the times uh, we can really start to, especially like, or at least for me, um, like if I'm working on something for so long, I kind of lose sight of like why I'm making it. Uh, so a lot of times it really helps a lot for me to just take a step back and realize like I'm not making for I'm not making this for anyone but for like myself and just to have fun. Um, so that's definitely something that I still have to remind myself, but um, it's a pretty big takeaway, I think. Uh, so yeah, with that, uh, here's a DM I got from a, a loving fan. Um, and yeah, that's all from me. So thank you for listening. Oh, that's adorable. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot nicer than that one guy uh, that reviewed Earth Defense Force Insect Armageddon uh, said it was a big, dumb game for big, dumb people. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's that's life. It's what happens. Um, oh, wonderful. Uh, so, yes, I, I have to say, like, the fact that you did this in high school um, is is just completely phenomenal that, that you were <laughs> able to put this together then. But also, I know you well enough to know it's also completely not surprising <laughs> <laughs> if I may, if I may say, I'll just share this with everyone here. Uh, Kenny came into my office for a, a office hour uh, last fall, and it's like, "Hey, what's your advice for level design?" And and what he showed me was something that I would have expected someone that completed CTT three forty five to have done. And then I immediately like, "You should join us in virtual labs." Well, no, uh, like Envision Center is actually paying me, right? So this is this is Kenny, right? Uh, uh, you know, you're doing great, uh, and it'll be really cool to Thank see you. what you continue to do as you progress uh, through the program. Yeah, so any absolutely. any questions for Kenny? We're now super duper late, but I'm, I'm okay with it, <laughs> if you're okay with it. So, oh, yeah. Uh, Sophia, you have a question. How did you find the time? Yeah, um, this is like, okay, I have a lot of hobbies, but... Um, I really, I dedicate a lot of my free time to like making sure that I have time to work on projects and, uh, do the stuff that I like. Um, you know, lucky for me, like I can spend a lot of time like by myself. That's not to say like, obviously everyone needs friends. I have plenty of friends that I, you know, I go out and I actually, you know, I'm a person as well. Um, but like I, it's very important for me to, um, like make the time like basically i i prioritize it as if it's just like some other responsibility that i have to do in my life you know um so yeah yeah i i think one of my biggest struggles and one of the reasons that knocked is nowhere near done um is because i just i never felt like i really had the time between you know work robotics school the student board of directors, the mayor's youth advisory council, it all just kind of starts to pile up on you. You know, it, I just, I don't have time to breathe sometimes. It's crazy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's another thing though. Yeah. Uh, like personally, I, like, I don't have that much, like you clearly have a lot on your plate. I don't have that much on my plate. Um, and it's very important to like not beat yourself up over like not having the time to do something. Cause I've certainly done it before too. Like if I'm not working on something, like that kind of toxic productivity mindset starts setting in like, um, like, what are you doing if you're not like working on a project, you know? Um, so that's really what I was talking about, like with stepping back and uh, learning to kind of love the process and, and uh, just, yeah, just go with it. Thank you. And, and yeah, I'll sure. add real, real quick. And if anyone has any other questions, think, think of it while I'm uh, giving my little spiel here. Um, you know, I, what, I think it's really important to remember for everybody that, uh, we are all on the same journey at different points and, and they're not all, there's no, there's not one like uniform speed, right? Like in my case, uh, I'll tell you when I was 16, 
I was just trying to lift Angus Young solos off ACDC records. Game development was not even in, like, you know, I was interested in it, but there was no, you know, this was in the 90s. There was no easy path to get educated in it uh, like there exists now. Um, and by the time I went to Southern, Meth- Southern Methodist University, uh, you know, to go to Guildhall to get my master's degree in it, um, you know, there were people that had already had jobs in the games industry that I was in class with. And I just remember how devastating it was to my personal morale to be like someone who's my classmate that's like it started way, way better. Right. And then it's like where, where you know, where I'm, I'm at at the time. Right. But, you know, we all progress uh, you know, at different rates. And, and so what you'll find is, at least for me, you kind of make these big jumps, right? Um, and so Kenny's in a place where he's just made a lot of progress, like in high school, early college. Um, and that's awesome. But we're all a little different. And we're all kind of, we'll all kind of hit our stride at different times. And as long as we're progressing, that's, that's the, the name of the game. So uh, with that said, any questions, any other questions on this? Okay, great. Um, uh, absolutely wonderful, uh, Kenny. I actually should have said I didn't know what to expect from you either. Um, uh, so the fact you pulled something from kind of your almost distant past now, I think is really neat. So yes, round of applause uh, for Kenny. Thank you so much. Ooh, thanks so much. Yeah, I just want to add one last thing, um, just a tidbit that kind of blew my mind. So I was, uh, I was preparing for like the presentation. Um, and I was just curious, like I searched the game up on YouTube. Um, and there's like there's like a surprising amount of gameplay videos and there's this one guy uh matt shia or matt shay or something he's like 2.5 million subscribers so i was just like i was going insane i don't know that was, that was just super <laughs> cool um but yeah that's neat that's cool all right cool thank you everyone yeah thank you okay now uh last but certainly not least elijah go ahead and take it away hi gamers <laughs> I'm going to try not to take too long since we're already 10 minutes over, so I'll go fast. Uh, There's no need to do that. Take take the, you know, everyone gets 15 minutes, so, um, you know, don't feel like you have to rush. All right, I'll take my time. I'll talk nice and slow. <laughs> now I'm being sarcastic. Where is the share button? Uh, should be in the bottom panel of, of buttons. It's like the... Oh, here it is. Yeah. Yeah, that does not look like a share screen button, to be honest. But... <laughs> the right one here okay also my birds here he's gonna be chirping in the background uh i can't stop him okay so okay so this is nazar uh so i didn't know what to expect with this whole thing i was invited like monday by kenny um just so i i didn't really know what this was so it might be a disaster but this is uh game I'm working on currently. Uh, just an early showcase. It's not like very far in. If you want to see the rest of my stuff, I have my, my portfolio link there. Um, I guess like a little bit about me. I've been doing game dev since I was like 10, uh, but only seriously since like freshman high school. Um, so it's been a couple of years, but this will load it's like a YouTube video. And because so there's a lot of like animations in this that are more smooth, and because it's all choppy, uh, it might be hard to see for some people, but play it here. So this is just a quick preview of what it is uh, before I actually talk about it. Just menu stuff there, chicken head. All right, and then here's actually like the battle system stuff. I can come back to this later. I'm just showing a little bit so people know what it looks like. Uh, that is an older version. This is more what it looks like now. Uh, background is not solid black anymore. Uh, a lot of these are temporary arts, but they don't really have a lot of animation to them. But yeah, so just a little bit on what this is, if it loads. Okay, so what is this arm? This is a roguelike deck builder, kind of. 
uh, not really, it just like superficially is, but it really plays more like a puzzle game. Uh, this is kind of going off of the design of, um, it wasn't based on this because this actually came out a little later, but um, Into the Breach, if anyone knows that, it's like uh, you have perfect knowledge of the of what's going on. Like you see what the enemies are doing and I really like that design where things aren't like random. Uh, so it's basically a card game where you have full knowledge of what the enemies are doing. Uh, so you ideally can plan every turn to be like the perfect turn. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like that into the breach with cards. And it really isn't anything like that actually, it's just that design principle. But, um, and this is based on a battle system from one of my previous bigger games called Child's Play. Uh, and that one, those that did play it loved it, but a lot of people didn't try it because it's kind of niche and it's kind of ugly, which was a little intentional, you'll see in a second. If anyone is interested in checking it out, you can play it for free in browser on itch. It is also on Google Play. It's not on iOS anymore because they charge you 100 a year to keep shit up and keep stuff up, sorry. That's a lot of money to keep a game that is pretty much free. So it's not on iOS anymore. Display. So this is just, uh, I'm gonna skim through this. So obviously this one is, it looks a little similar with the whole card thing. It's, it's a lot uglier though. Uh, it was kind of modeled after like a child's drawing aesthetic. It, it, the point was that uh, it's called Child's Play. It looks really goofy, but it's actually like a strategic game. Uh, you know, that's an interesting idea, but I feel like it doesn't make it very marketable <laughs> to do weird, uh, weird stuff like that. For some reason, I can't stop the video without closing this. So that is, uh, that's what that was. Uh, and I wanted, I, I made that game. It was pretty good. Those that did play it liked it, um, but not a lot of people checked it out. Even I can put it on Azure, put it on Google Play. Um, but it's kind of like a weird aesthetic. A lot of people didn't really take a look at it. And also I, there was a lot of flaws in the battle system. It was like a fully ground up battle system that I made. And I spent a couple months making that. Uh, I spent like seven months on that game. I think my sophomore going into junior like summer. And um, I really liked the system, but there was a lot of flaws that I found over time, like developing that. Obviously, you know, second iteration of any game is better. And uh, there was other things that I wanted to add to the system, improve, just like tweaks that made it better. Um, so Child's Play was was about uh, over time building the most like absurdly overpowered deck you could. And this is very fun. However, I realized that the system's strength was really supported um, with like the strong strategic stuff where you can see what the enemies are doing exactly and you adapt to that. Um, and so I thought it was a little more fun when you didn't use the broken cards and combos. And so Child's Play is more like a power fantasy version of the game and Nazar is more of the intentional, like roguelike, um, purely strategic version. So it'll be much slower paced, uh, but it's a very similar system. Um, so Nazar is Child's Play, but intentionally making every card fair so you never leave the, uh, shit, I actually have to think about this one phase. Can't just mash, you know, every battle. And so it's kind of the perfect version of that battle system. Uh, and more importantly, with a more marketable aesthetic, so people actually like check it out. Um, so this is the project status. It's still pretty early. I've only been working on it for like two, three months. Uh, and there's not a whole lot of content and it's mostly temporary artwork right now. Um, part of it is because the development slowed because I actually had to rebuild the whole thing from zero because of a major engine change, um, which allowed me to fix a lot of bugs and uh, root things with the system architecture. But it does make it appear that I made no progress in two months because I actually had to, it was all back end stuff. I had to basically redo the whole like system part. Um, so right now, all you can do is play through random battles. The actual pilgrimage, which is the name for like the roguelike runs basically is not yet set up. And the system is fully designed. All the design aspect of it is, is finished. I just have to turn out content, make enemies, cards, abilities, that kind of thing. Uh, so what is going well is uh, the design is already established and I think it's, very good. It's very strong. It's definitely the strongest design game that I've made. Um, I have, I'm the eldest of five. And so I have four like dedicated testers. <laughs> so my brothers are, are dedicated testers. I have them uh, find bugs for me all the time and they, they do balancing stuff. Um, so that's nice to just have like a built in network to help with that. Uh, Cause as Kenny said, you absolutely cannot balance your own game. I learned that hardcore with the last one. Uh, the aesthetic, especially the UI is, which is what I focus on a lot with this one was, um, I specifically designed it to be easy to create, but still look really cool. Like obviously it's very geometric, it's all um, vectors and stuff. And so I can make them really fast and, and but it still looks cool. And then spreadsheets going well, I'll show you more about that later. Here's like our style test, just a couple of the characters on animated. 
what's not going well is uh, this is currently more of the phase I'm in right now is uh, consistency, the typical vice. Uh, I currently work on it maybe a couple hours a week, like two or three hours. Um, not enough. There's not like enough at stake for this to be like, oh God, I need to finish this or I can't feed my kid type thing. Um, and it's kind of hard to keep up with working on a game while also doing school and like pandemic depression and stuff. Uh, absolutely do have the time. It's just like you don't have the energy. And this isn't like, um, this is like a self-defeating cycle. I know a lot of people will relate to this, but like as a kind of dedicated person to this kind of thing, you, your self-worth is tied up in your output, which is not healthy, but definitely can be true. And, uh, and just the fact that you, you know, you, you haven't made something in a week. And so it makes it harder to actually start it because like, yeah, it just makes it harder to actually get back into it every time you take a short break. But I'm, I'm working on that uh, to say that it's, Consistency is not an issue right now would be a bald faced lie. So uh, cool stuff to learn from. Uh, who am I to teach you anything? I don't mean to brag, but that last game made $200. Uh, yeah, that's right, triple digits. So <laughs> basically, I'm famous. Uh, facetious in case anyone is not going to be sarcastic. But uh, this is obviously not a completed project, and I don't want to sound like I really know what I'm doing. But I do have some tips to help fellow devs. Uh, first is this resource. Those of you that haven't seen this, you definitely recognize some of the icons. This site, uh, GameIcons.net, they have thousands of like free open source stuff. You can, uh, I use these as like temporary artworks. So you can actually use them for permanent artworks as well. It's just that it's obviously not your aesthetic. So um, like these are super good for, for turning out icons for things and, and just like using them for temporary things. Uh, how I'm doing using it in this game is I'm, I'm using the icons, but you can see up here, I'm, I'm making it more into the proper aesthetic. Uh, of this game, just that I don't have to make hundreds of icons from scratch because that's a lot of work to do solo. So also is the animation for it. Um, again, you probably have to watch the videos outside of the web because it's kind of laggy to see how like smooth they are and everything. But uh, I specifically designed the aesthetic to be easy to turn out. Uh, so I would have used a skeletal animator like Spine, if, if anyone knows what that is, um, but that costs a lot of money. And doesn't really, uh, a lot of the other free alternatives don't really link with the uh, engine I use, which is, I use Game Maker right now just because I'm familiar with it the most. Um, those kind of modular things save a lot of memory. Like sprite sheets are extremely cost free and uh, kind of dumb in my opinion. Uh, like I, obviously they're necessary for sprite games, but, um, but this is not. They are HD little guys. And so I didn't want to have like tons of files just from the same guy, just like slightly different positions. And I wanted them to be dynamic. Um, if you see in the video, they blink at random times. Every time they get hurt, they blink. Um, and there's a couple different animations that they have that are kind of layered onto the thing. Also, the eye follows the mouse. Um, no matter where they are, what state they're in, their eye is always following your mouse. And that kind of stuff is hard to do with existing things. So I did make a custom animation thing. And I guess my tip here is like, if you have a certain aesthetic you're going for, then just like make your own animation system because it's really not that hard. It's just like, it took me a couple days to figure it out, but um, with like pretty minimal effort, you you can get full control over what your stuff looks like. So if this loads or not, close this. So this is like the uh, the editor I have, which is just built in. Um, so I have all the stuff layered. I can easily import these pieces, move them all around. Uh, there's the UI stuff. Yeah, and just right here, you see me ripping it apart. Just so you can see how it works. They're just easing between two things because that's all I needed to give them a little bit of light. But I didn't have to have like full, um, like full state machine kind of thing. I just needed something that gives them some kind of some kind of movement um, and still be very easy to make. So they're all in like pieces like this. And this is the bigger thing. Abstracted content. So my biggest tip for people in general, obviously do pre-production. That's super important. Uh, someone here said that. Um, I, I love that phase more than anything. Like I turn out those games and documents and stuff. Uh, I actually like that part, but those that don't, it's extremely helpful to do. And this is something I recommend a lot of people do is, is spreadsheets. Uh, pretty much I automate everything I can with a spreadsheet where, um, so once the battle engine was set up, I never touched that code again. I don't mess with the with the actual source code. It, it's basically its own engine now. 
Um, all interactions are automatically parsed from the imported spreadsheet, and I have like a little bit of a preview here. I'll go over to that. So basically, I can easily change effects, colors, rarity, staff, abilities, anything by just uh, changing like words in a spreadsheet rather than getting your grubby bug causing fingers all over the source code. Um, if you try to hard code stuff, you're going to break things. That's, it's always happened. Uh, it's just not fun. So just get it perfect, airtight, and then everything goes through like an extra layer of filtering where you have it on like an abstracted uh, thing that you edit it with. And the bonus for this is that fans, if I do end up having fans for this kind of game, uh, can easily make their own content and modify. They can easily add their own characters and cards and whatever by just adding it into a spreadsheet, which is way less daunting for people to do than um, actually, you know, hard code things in. Um, so I basically made the game into its own, like, adaptable engine rather than hard coding anything. And this does work best with system-driven games, obviously, um, but I'm sure you people are smart. I'm sure you can apply it to other genres. Like, I, you know, I'm off the top of my head, I know a fighting game could do this. You have, like, different animations as, like, a frame or like frame data for animations in the spreadsheet rather than hard coded in stuff like that. It just helps you um, manage it. Uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Boo. <laughs> and I have here, uh, I do have a, a discord with the development. It's not super populated right now, but if anyone is interested, uh, just email me and I'll send you the link. And I hope to finish it by the end of the year, but you know, I gotta get my shit together and start working on it more often. That's it. All right. So obviously, I think yes, yes. Uh, give a, a, a pause there. Uh, obviously, I think we all um, are really impressed by the clean sort of art presentation, and I'll just comment like the use of of spreadsheets, which uh, so game maker can accept that input, uh, right? I, I assume that oh, must be true, uh, which I did not know. I had them go in as CSVs. That's a universally accepted file oh, format um, right okay for those that don't know csv is just a text file where the spreadsheet turns into just a comma between lines and then you just import that as a grid um yeah it's just like a 2d array yes and um just so everyone knows it, take my game scripting class unreal except csvs it's it's kind of like like uh, elijah said it's kind of universal thing so uh fortunately you can uh uh, you know, open up uh, Excel and just make it as a regular spreadsheet and convert to CSV, um, you know, pretty, pretty easily. So, uh, okay. Any questions? Yeah, I didn't get super into the system because it's kind of intricate to explain in a short presentation, but right. uh, those that are interested, uh, the first game is the child play one is free online and it's very similar systems. If you want to see what it will be like, you can play that one. All right, uh, Yorgos, and uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Yorgos. What was kind of your inspiration for the aesthetics of the creatures in your game? <laughs> That's a little bit of a long story, but Nazar is the uh, the word for the evil eye, which is just that icon. It, it's like baked into the story of it. I don't it, like it's a little intricate with how it works. But basically, it's like a pilgrimage. They're all all the um, characters are like blind. They just have blank irises. And if you get to the top and you climb the mountain, then they let you see, and you get the evil eye. Uh, it's based on like a mythos thing, but partially I just thought it was a cool symbol and I needed a cool symbol to like, you know, make it uh, like I started gameplay first. I had the system already. I was like, what would fit with this would still be cool. Um, and I just think they look awesome. Yeah, I really like the aesthetic. Yeah, cool. Yeah. And the little dudes are like all demons just because I like designing those. All right. And uh, Sophia, I think you had a question. No, um. He had the same question I did. He kind of answered it. Okay. All right. Uh, cool. Any other questions for Elijah? Okay. Going once, going twice. Okay. Let me do my little... Oh, Kenny, you had a question. How are you so cool, man? <laughs> I love you, Kenny. <laughs> He's my like uh, partner with group stuff right now. All right. Cool. Cool. Um, all right, well, unless there's anything else, uh, raise your hand and I will stop myself. Um, but I will do my wrap-up spiel now. Uh, we are 26 minutes late, but that's okay, because I think it was well worth it. Uh, absolutely well worth it. Um, so I want to point out, um, I think there's a lot of themes that are sort of similar to just about everything that, that we've talked about, right? Like having a good pre-production, planning things out, uh, sort of that ounce of planning, you know, is worth many pounds uh, later on, right? Uh, we saw that come up time and time again. 
Um, I think art style is something that we've seen time and time again, where like having a consistent visual look, which is hard is like, I'm coming at this from a level designer perspective. That's why, you know, if you're Joey Belt, environment artist, this, this sort of is, is like a natural thing for, for you. Right. And some of you other are more artistically oriented. Uh, I'm a musician and, you know, I could probably learn to draw if I really tried, but it's not really my my bag. Um, and so I have to think about this a little more, right? And when you're doing what a level designer would do, like myself, grabbing things from the asset store, trying to put, that's where you're going to have to like look and, and think real hard about like, are these assets fitting together? Is it, is it all working together? Because that's going to make everything look better, almost regardless of the individual quality of each piece. Um, and also, I thought we had some interesting discussion about, you know, work-life balance and in time, right? Like, you know, finishing the importance of finishing, but the importance of stepping back and and kind of reanalyzing what you're doing, right? So hopefully uh, we got some cool things out of this. So uh, once again, I want to thank you all for, for doing this uh, two and a half hours. I, you know, I'm very thankful uh, and that's great. Uh, yeah, they, uh, yeah, that looks awesome. I would uh, look ridiculous, but maybe try to wear it. My kids would laugh at me. Uh, uh, but um, uh, yeah, on a reading day even coming out. So thank, thank you so much. Uh, so this is being recorded sometime later tonight. I will get it posted on my YouTube and send it out to everyone. Uh, so in, unless anyone has anything else to say... I think we're done. All right. So give all, everyone give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you, everybody. Um, well done, everyone. Yes. And yeah. Sophia, you, you want to add one more thing, I think? I just wanted to say thank you guys for the opportunity. And it was really nice to meet all of you. And you all seem like great people. And I'm really excited to play all your games. All right. And, and I'll just say one more thing, uh, too, to add, you know, what we're seeing here is, it's amazing how much progress the Purdue program has made even since I started, uh, right? Like the student work just gets better and, and I'm continually shocked by it. And that just continues to happen. And that's the result of, it's a little bit of what uh, Professor Woodinghill and myself and uh, you know Professor Triplett, Professor Busas are all working hard to do, but it's a lot of you, right? It's, it's mostly you, a little us. So feel good about that. Okay, everyone. Um, have a great evening. Thanks for holding this, Rob. Yeah, no problem. It's my pleasure.